Hello and welcome to the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, episode 39, The Next Generation. From Hamilton, Ontario, I'm Sean, and here with me, live and direct from Windsor, Ontario, the Tabletop Bellhop himself, Mo T. I am the Tabletop Bellhop, your cardboard concierge, answering your game and game night questions and striving to make everyone's gaming experience better. Let me put my years of game playing, event organizing, and game night hosting to use for you. I'd like to say hi to everyone in the lobby here on Twitch. We start here live every Wednesday night at 9.30 p.m. Eastern at twitch.tv slash tabletopbellhop and continue on even after the double bell ends the show for more Off the Books After Show. That's right. Stick around at the end of the show where we will do an Off the Books, not recorded. Well, it's recorded. So Off the Books, is it doesn't end up on the podcast. So we're just going to hang out and chat with those of you who took the time to join us here on Twitch. Now, for those of you who may be getting jealous sitting listening to the podcast, if you do want to hear what we talk about in our penthouse suite, all you've got to do is back our Patreon at the $4 level and you will get that bonus audio. Now today we're talking about raising the next generation of gamers, gaming with our kids. After the main topic, I've got my final review of Fields and Flocks for Builders of Blankenberg and my first play of Stuff Fables in our Tabletop Gaming Weekly segment. And I've got the multiverse for the DC comic book Deck Builder. We love interacting with our listeners and viewers. We're here for you. Each week, we're going to highlight some of those discussions that happen, feedback we've received, comments on our content, gaming discussions, social media threads, and so on. We want to share what people are saying, both positive and negative. We get better with your comments and suggestions, and if you'd like to let us know something about the show, send your feedback to mo at tabletopbellhop.com and or sean at tabletopbellhop.com. That's S-E-A-N. You can also hit us up on social media where I can be found everywhere as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. Now, we had way more feedback and interaction this past week over the last one. It wasn't Easter weekend. I don't know what it is. It was Easter weekend. I don't know what it was. We got way more feedback this time. First off, though, I want to thank everyone who has been giving me links for my master lists. I have added over 250 tabletop podcasts to the list, a slew of YouTube channels, a bunch of Twitch streamers, and a handful of Patreon projects to the list. Now, I'm trying to make these lists as inclusive as possible. So if you've got a podcast, if you stream here on Twitch, or you've got a YouTube channel that has tabletop gaming content as well as any patreon projects for gaming content and it's not on one of my lists let me know and i'll get it added you can find all of these lists over on the webpage at tabletopbellhop.com it's right under our logo now on to some specific comments first i've got one off youtube and it was on our gloomhaven faq episode which sean was just pointing out before the show seems to have gotten rather popular lambo amazeballs commented Thanks for doing this video. It was good listening while I was painting, and I learned a few things our Gloomhaven group had done incorrectly as well. Well, thanks, Lambo. It's great to hear that us going through that fact is helping out more than just Mo's game. Uh, now, we've got another Gloomhaven comment, this one in regards to the group's failed attempt at <laughs> scenario number 20. Red writes, Wow, we had almost the exact same experience here last night, within a week of your sharing this. Found your page here by Googling around with the same question in mind. We felt we played suboptimally as well. By the time we went down, Jexera had eight health left. The biggest bear for us was physically getting her in order to attack. We played too defensively while she surrounded her hexes with enemies. Didn't help that we'd had a penalty from a road event, nor that our characters were two level twos and one level three, the lowest possible composition, composition for a level two difficulty for the scenario. Card flips were mostly not in our favor. We split up to get the treasure. Everything was just barely in place to screw us here. <laughs> we're now three level three characters once we regroup in Gloomhaven. More health, new cards, new perks, and extra small item slots. We snagged the axe and should be much more prepared for next time. I have to agree, given the pacing of the leveling, uh, our only level three character had been pushed over the edge by a treasure chest bonus. Minor spoiler, I guess. The completely optional room with an item that helps us with this scenario, but you can't be used until the second attempt. And the fact that there's no reason at all to enter that room a second time if you've already looted the chest. It all lines up to suggest that this scenario was intended to have a high risk of needing to replay it. Props to those who did not need a second playthrough. It feels like we were so close, but no cigar. 
Brad, I gotta say, I know exactly how you feel. Uh, that's exactly what it felt like, like playing through that scenario, especially, let's like, say you get that item, the item that is perfect for that scenario in that scenario, and you can't use what you find in a scenario that time. It definitely seems to be set up for at least uh, some groups, if not the majority of groups, to fail the first time through. I don't know if that's just trying to teach you a lesson or not. Now, one big difference from when you went through and what I went through is we were well higher level by the time we went through, where you guys rushed that scenario as quick as possible. So you obviously just did the um, actual storylines chasing Z Jexira in a straight row, whereas we were like, ooh, squirrel, side quest, and went off and did a bunch of other stuff. So I'm sure that changed things up. But I do have to say, hopefully this makes you feel better. Our second attempt went so much better than the first time. Now, we talked about that on the last podcast, if you haven't heard it yet. And I got to say, some of it was luck, but I think more of it was knowing what to expect but I also just think we played better. Uh, what I can say that it is doable, so don't give up. Now, here is one tip. Try to get Jexira stuck in the doorway to that room so that anything she spawns ends up behind her and the guards get stuck behind her and can't get out. On to the next comment. Phil sent us a comment about game weight. And actually, we've got a whole bunch of comments about game weight here. So Phil said, heavy games feel much better for me, but I still play and can enjoy lighter games. All in all, though, I feel I get more from heavier games. Of course, being a war gamer probably contributes significantly to this mindset. Thanks, Phil. I feel like many of the tabletop war game folks probably lean towards the heavier games in general, since mm -hmm. there are a lot of similarities between the uh, war games, and, you know, the tabletop war games, and a lot of those heavier games like the 18xx and, and, mm -hmm. and 4x games. Now, continuing on with game weight, Smug Air Throwing Scorpion <laughs> says. Mostly depends on who I'm with. However, after a four-hour Twilight Imperium session, you appreciate things like Sagrada and Santorini. On the flip side, after those, you want to get something like Dinosaur Island or Doom to the table. Well, thanks, Scorpion. And I gotta say, if your group can get Twilight Imperium done in four hours, props to you. I think our Quiscus was six. And I gotta say, Smug Air Throwing Scorpion, that is a fantastic handle. Uh, it's also appreciated by our chat room. We are, you're getting some thumbs up here, if you happen to be listening. Inconspicuous, not incon, sorry, unconspicuous writes, Board Game Geek, wait for and up. Gaia Project and up. Well, thanks, in unconspicuous. Uh, Jurgen Hubert writes, The rule book should be big enough to stun unruly players. Not that I have ever done this before, of course. Violence at the gaming table is wrong. We at Tabletop Bellhop do not condone hitting anyone with rule books or game boxes or any other game component, except maybe the foam clubs in UGTech. Brian Sinclair writes, before kids, I loved heavy games. These days, though, it's harder to find the time. And when I can, I like that time to be a bit more social and not as hardcore as heavy games tend to get. 60 to 90 minutes feels like a good sweet spot. Uh, I think all of us with kids can relate to that one, Brian. Uh, it's uh, tough to sit down and uh, plan out a six-hour slog when uh, there, are, there are kids around. Now, I Heart Board Games says... As I age, I'm preferring lighter and lighter. I can still do a heavy three-hour game, but I find myself preferring a one-and-a-half hour with a ten-minute teach. Maybe it'll change, like my taste for olives. <laughs> I've got to admit, I, I feel the same way as far as changing up what I feel like playing. Even back when we did uh, our top 20 games, my top 20 games, and I said at the time, it's my top 20 games of right now. Uh, right now, I'm definitely leaning towards uh, heavy games. I'm, I've really been enjoying some thinky games, but that could shift anytime. I uh, give it two weeks and I might be sitting there wanting to get in some nice half hour party games. It's not likely, but it may happen. Blob Wicked Elf King writes, depends a lot on a lot of factors, usually who I'm playing with and how much time we have. Generally speaking, though, I prefer lighter to medium weight games. Well, thanks, Blob. Finally, Bill, just Bill, writes, I like a wide range, but I th think I find games around a weight of three on BGG to be the most satisfying. Well, thanks, Bill. Uh, it's cool to see overall such a wide variety of preferences, right? We didn't have anyone that's like, I really like super light games, but just in that sampling, there were people that liked the heavier end of things and people like medium weight. As I said before, not every game is for everyone, but there's probably a game out there for everyone. Well, thanks everyone for all the feedback and participation this week. It's greatly appreciated.
We record the show live Wednesday nights at 9.30 Eastern on Twitch, and we encourage people to drop in and take part in our chat room. The Lobby. Don't forget, if you're here live, we continue the show after the Double Bell in an Off the Books After Show, as well as some special features that might make it onto YouTube, thanks to our moderator, Angie Games. So tonight, Sean and I are going to be talking about gaming with kids. So what I would love to see from our chat room is some of your experiences with gaming with kids. And if you have any tips or tricks you figured out for teaching the next generation of gamers. And we'll be back checking in with the chat room throughout the show. But before we jump in, I noticed Poncho has picked up a copy of Wingspan. Nice. I, uh, Brimstone Games was advertising. So if you're in Windsor, they've got copies. I don't know where they got them from. They even said they were surprised they got them. So they only had four copies. Actually, I shouldn't even mention it because by now they, I'm sure they they're, might, sold. they're probably they're, gone they're probably if there were four copies. Yeah. But yeah, supposedly they all hit stores and it surprised the stores. So I thought that was interesting. Yeah, I wonder now, if they... Shadzar's noting that the category we are in is rather flooded right now. Is it worth switching over to board games? Because mm -hmm. I can do it. I, yeah. While I we're know. in this segment, you know what? I'll do it right now. Sure. Of course, board games is possibly even busier. And happy birthday, Poncho. Indeed. Happy there birthday. There we go. We are now in board games. We'll see if that makes a difference. Card and board games. They changed it. Ooh. Oh, no, the tag is card import games. Oh, uh, okay. Lock them in the basement. Enjoy your gaming. That will not be a suggestion we use. <laughs> oh. I yeah. still like the fact that we're, we're, we're jumping ahead slightly here, only slightly, but I love the fact that back in the day, Games Workshop put out kids' games just for something to distract your kids while you played Warhammer. The yeah. fact that the company came up with that concept blew me away back in the day. I bet then I think technically I was a kid, though, so... We are here to answer your game, gaming, or game night questions. You can send your questions to questions at tabletopbellhop.com or head over to tabletopbellhop.com and click on Ask the Bell to Hop. Uh, social media works too. We're everywhere as Tabletop Bell Hop, one word. Best way to get me questions, though, is do it on the website. There's no way I'll miss them then. It's not going to scroll by in the middle of a tweet stream or something. But I'm not going to say no if I catch a question anywhere. Today we are talking about gaming with kids and raising the next generation of gamers. So we've talked about playing games with kids a couple times, but the focus of those past episodes was game suggestions, like specific game suggestions. Uh, we were answering questions where someone was looking for cooperative kids games, and we talked all about a bunch of different cooperative kids games, which the best is still Ghost Fighting Treasure Hunters by far. Uh, there are other ones. And then later we got another question that said, oh, it's great. You covered co-op games. What about non-co-op games? So we had an episode where we talked about what kind of non-cooperative games are great for hooking kids. But the focus then was on what games to pick and how to get kids to the table and the fact of like it should match themes they enjoy and it should be about um if they should be exciting games and they should be quick and they should be easy to teach. But what we never really talked about was actually sitting down and playing the games with our kids, right? Like now that you got a list of games you went out and bought, what do you do with them, right? Well, obviously sit down at the table and play, but I thought it'd be worth talking more about this. Now, some of this comes from our competition episode, which I was that last week, two weeks ago. Two. Two weeks ago when we were talking competition, uh, Sean came up with a really good point about teaching kids early and getting to them early and teaching them good habits and um, table culture is not the word I want to use. I'm trying to think of the word I want. But basically, ha having them be good gamers and getting to them early. And I thought it was worth expanding on that and having a topic having a talk about that because both of us are playing games with our kids. Sean actually more often than I do because my kids are busy doing their own thing all the time. And I've got other adults to play with more often than Sean does at this point. So, but we do both game with our kids. Yeah. And I've been involved in a few discussions about this on Reddit as well. It's been interesting other people, seeing other people, uh, how other people take my suggestions, my thoughts on the topic and how they interpret my ideas. Uh, and from that, I've gotten a little bit better at, uh, learning how to express my ideas. I noticed uh, some of the things I was saying, I was I was putting out in one way and people were, were coming back and talking about, uh, you know, my ideas about, you know, about quitting games mm -hmm. um, and coming back with, uh, well, yeah, but you're teaching your kids how to, you know, force, you know, force quit when they, when they're angry. I'm like, well, no, 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 that's a different topic. You gotta, <laughs> you gotta, you gotta teach them that separately from, mm -hmm. uh, 
from the whole, you know, teaching them that it's okay to stop a game. Um, so it's been an interesting sort of seeing that develop uh, with my discussions on Reddit. Yeah, Shadzar's got the table manners. That's yep. more what I was looking for. Yeah. Exactly, table manners. Even if you're not playing at a table. So just to, to get a bit of perspective here, I'd like to, uh, I'll start with Sean. When did you start gaming with your kids? Is this uh, an all along thing or did you wait to a certain age? Uh, we started uh, games pretty early on. I mean, well, you know, again, you're not your favorite, but we have, we've had Candyland in the, in the house for, you know, forever. Yep. Uh, as well as, you know, games like Yahtzee and Uno um, and a lot of the standards. We did unfortunately pick up the, the game of life at one point, uh, the newest version or newer version that uh, is a horrible disaster in my opinion. Wow. Um, so I like Game of Life, the original, but I haven't played the modern yeah, one. Yeah, I love the original, idea. and that's why we bought it. I have really fond memories of yep. playing the Game of Life with my family, uh, but they've tried to sanitize it for some of the, um, you know, impolitical ideas mm -hmm. and uh, ruined the game in its uh, in its process. Right. But yeah, I mean, you know, we've got the Connect Fours and, and a lot of the, you know, kids mm -hmm. games. Uh, but again, we started playing all of those games early. Uh, and again, you know, say what you will about Candyland, but it's a good way to just teach people about how to sit at a table and play something. Yeah. Even if it's not a game, that doesn't matter to the kids. Yeah. So we, we started like right away. I, I honestly don't remember. I'm pretty sure before the kids were born, we probably picked up a couple games or, you know, when they were definitely when they were still in the cradle. Right. Uh, we picked up some really simple kids games. Uh, we did not go the mass market route. I tended to avoid the mass market games. I said, we, we have some mass market games, but I didn't do the candy land or life. Uh, we have a copy of Uno, but that was later. We started off with a lot of the blue orange and habit games, the, the very wooden games, um, there's another, Zoc is another company. Those three companies, Blue Orange Games, Hub, and Zoc were most of the ones we got. But most of those are just versions of uh, more mainstream games, right? Like um, King uh, Ben Domino is a really simple domino game where you're just matching. And well, they happen to be bent because the kids think they're cute, that they make swirly patterns, right? Uh, there was a matching game, a memory game that was kind of a mix of memory and bingo, where you're flipping over tiles, but you're also trying to match a player card you have. So you're flipping them over, trying to get a match of two, but when you do, you get to fill your card. So it's just that step above memory, a little more to it. There was a racing game called Mons on that. And you already hit on the main point, I think, that you can kind of start at any age, but the thing you need to start with are not good games. You need to start with games that teach those basic skills. Which, again, I, I will bash on Candyland forever because I can't stand it. And I just think there's better choices to teach <laughs> the same are, skills. Yep. <laughs> but it does teach basic skills. It teaches kids colors. It teaches kids um, pattern recognition. It teaches them counting. It teaches them taking turns. It teaches them holding on to a card of hand. A hand of cards, not a card of hands. That's I don't know what that is. That's a Warhammer thing. <laughs> You've got, uh, I don't even know, there, there's so many of those basic skills, right? Uh, winning, losing, the, the fact that you take turns when playing a game, all of that's important. And to be honest, it really doesn't matter what game you use to do that. Yep. I, then the more important part there is that the kid's interested. And if bright colors and lollipops are what the kid is attracted to, Candyland's great. Yep, and someone's going to quote that and just take that out of context <laughs> and have there me say Candyland's great. Like I said, personally, I think there's better options. I, there are, I would and there, you know what? There game. absolutely are. Uh, my wife isn't a gamer, though. Uh, so, you know, her experience was, again, more with the mass market stuff. And that's the stuff that she feels more comfortable with mm -hmm. and she's more interested in playing. And so, again, part of what's playing with those kids is also playing with the family. So, you know, you want something that the whole family is going to be involved with because... How you play games with your family is is what your kids see and and mm -hmm. what the kids pick up on, uh, and that's why I wouldn't want to play you know Monopoly with someone who isn't a good uh, you know good player, good winner, good loser right. because the kids are going to watch that and they're going to see that, and that's one of those skills that they you know kids pick up skills at the table and yeah. lo losing badly is in some ways a skill that they will pick up if given the opportunity. Yeah. Very true. So I'm just, uh, I already mentioned some of them. I'm just wondering if you can think of any other basic skills we're trying to teach. Like I'm thinking really young age, right? Like they can't read yet at this point. Um, pattern, you know, pattern matching, uh, counting colors, shapes, uh, the, the super basic stuff. Yeah. 
I said at this point. And then the gaming aspects of that are stuff like taking turns. Yep. Um, your stuff versus my stuff versus our stuff. Whatever that what happens to be for yep. that. Uh, one of our popular ones for that us was uh, kids of kids of Catan was good for that because you had to manage your resources right. and you could trade, but you only traded with the board. So there yep. was no bad feelings. Yep. Our players got left out. Uh, we actually had a uh, a kids Monopoly uh, version. Um, it was a very, very dumbed down Monopoly version, but you had your your money and your properties mm -hmm. and uh, it, it basically eliminated anything that would cause any hope, hope of rage, except maybe for the parents who thought it was a horrible game. But well, that's yeah, just me. That's, that's part of it. <laughs> the other thing, too, is at this point, if you're the parent, you should be looking to have fun by your kid having fun. Like you, yeah. you're, you're looking to, to the joy of seeing them learn, right? You're not expected to have necessarily have fun playing these games. Yep. Now I'll say there are some out there that are better than others. Like uh, again, that Monza is actually a really solid game that, that teaches pattern recognition. That's just as fun with adults. But at that point, you know, I've met gamers, unfortunately, that think that it's more important the parent has fun too. And I'm like, at that age, no, I don't think yeah. so. No, the, the, like, the, like, it's nice if you can have fun, but really, you're just trying to get the kid hooked at this yeah, point. Yeah, it's, it's a bonus. You, you don't want something that's going to drive you crazy. I mean, you don't want that, you know, baby shark song that's going to, you know, get stuck in your head and make you tear out your eyes because it, it happens so many times. You don't want a game that's as bad as that song. But yeah. at the same time, it doesn't have to be, you know, the next Catan or the next, you know, whatever. It can just be a decent enough game that gets what mm -hmm. it needs done. Now, uh, our chat's focusing on role-playing here for a bit, so I, I kind of want to bring that up. At this age, like, I'm again, I'm thinking first introduction here. Like, this is this is toddler, before grade school, right? I just stuck to imagination, right? I did not throw rules in. There are systems out there for playing with kids at that age. Um, I did pick up a couple of them. I read them, and then I kind of moved away from them and just did the more group storytelling. And what I strongly recommend, not that we had them at the time, is things like Rory Story Cube where you're going to roll the cubes and then the kid's going to tell a story based on the symbols they see on the dice, yeah. right? You don't, at that point, I don't think you want to impose limits on their imagination. It's I, better to keep it open. Yeah, I would personally not want to start any sort of uh, limitation on imagination before, say, eight as a just sort of a ballpark um, earliest time I would consider it. Uh, and that's based on my kids. And, you know, every, again, every, every family is going to be different in how their kids uh, age and mature. Well, but yes. in my family, I wouldn't have wanted to do any limitation until about eight. Uh, with my daughter, I still probably wouldn't actually. My son, he's, uh, he's more amicable to rules and, uh, right. and things like that. Now, that's a good note. We probably should have started off with this. No, every kid is different and what works for us may not work for you. And yes, it is amazing if you could get your kid to play Power Grid at age five. Congratulations. That's not the average kid. Yep. And if your kid is 13 and still can't grasp Power Grid, that's fine too, right? Uh, every kid's different. You're going to have to cater this to your own thing. You know your kids better than we do. And if and you're 40 and can't handle Power Grid, that's still okay. Yes, very <laughs> true. Very true. We talked about game weight last time. You just yep. stay on the lower scale and there's there nothing wrong with that. So moving forward to a little older, right? So on, on to uh, harder games is probably not the right term, but more complicated games. This is where you want to teach more skills of like the other thing to stick to when they're younger too is cooperative games is really good for that because then you can have open information, right? Cards are out on the table. This is when you want to switch to now you have personal information, you have hidden information, you may have hidden roles. This is where, now this is totally your judgment and your family where you might want to throw in games with bluffing and things like that. Because uh, sad as it is in our society, lying to people is a skill that should be developed and doing it through board games is not a bad way to do it. And it's way better if your kid learns to lie playing coup than it does they learn to lie because they did something nasty at school that they don't want to tell you about. Yeah. Yeah, one of the things I find with heart when you're getting into the harder games is this is where, if possible, it's best to team up with your kids. So you've got mm -hmm. a, one parent and one child, um, uh, or you know, however however that may play out, uh, and that it just helps you because a lot of times when you're getting to these harder games, um, depending on your child, they may struggle with some of the information, uh, but also want to keep it private because it's not if it's not an open information game. And so if you do that teaming up, you can help them giving mm -hmm. them suggestions as to how to play or, or, how, or guiding them in directions 
uh, without having to worry about conflicting with your own hand or, or cards. Yeah. Uh, and that's always, that's always beneficial, at least at first, uh, when you first move into those harder games with hidden knowledge. Oh, even, even in nowadays, like, uh, the first, we'll be talking about stuff fables later. It's something we should have done more of. We, we, we kind of let the kids sink and swim and uh, swink or swim. And that was maybe a bad choice at that time. So the other thing you're going to have more of here, uh, is more limitations, right? You're going to have more rules, more harder rules. Uh, things are going to be more structured. There'll be more things to remember, right? Uh, going back to last week, the games get heavier, right? So they're a little different. Now is when is I would introduce a role-playing games, which the first one we used was um, Mermaid Adventures by Aloy LaSanta. And all it uses is D6s. You have black and white D6s. You roll them. If the white's higher than the black die, you succeed, right? Really, really simple system, but still has some rules, right? And gets the kids used to rolling dice. There is a character sheet. There are stats, right? It introduces all the those basic things. That's where I start to impose the limitations. And I've got to say, when my kids first started playing Mermaid Adventures, it took some work. Um, I think I might have been better starting with Powered by the Apocalypse because, man, they wanted narrative control because they're like, oh, wait, I walk into the room and the bad guy does this. And I'm like, oh, wait, daddy controls the bad guys, right? <laughs> so we had to have a conversation about table roles and how in different role-playing games, they're all different. Now, I admit what they were doing was fantastic. So we could kind of play that way one game or like fine we'll just throw the rule book out and we'll tell a mermaid story and we kind of went back to that but then next time we played i'm like do you want to play by the rules of the game or do you want to just talk about mermaids I'm like oh we want to try the game so then we started constraining things and explaining it and like oh pull it back go forward and what was fantastic for at least my family at that point is playing that got my older daughter interested in running her own game and that like at a young age, right, which was, was she was eight, I think, at the time. And so we went out and bought the My Little Pony Tales of Equestria game for her. And she devoured that book. So now would you find now in, in hindsight, uh, is Mermaid Tales a better starter than Equestria? Oh, definitely. Tales okay. of Equestria is like a crunchy, hard, traditional role-playing game with DMs and players and exploding dice. And it's like a really simple version of Savage Worlds, but it's still like Savage Worlds versus just completely... I, I like the other uh, Lloyd's game's almost storytelling. Like, it, it's really close. You're, you're, like I said, you, you, if you're, your mind is three, you decide as a DM what the difficulty is, and you give them that many black dice. And then their mind's three, they take that many white dice, and you just roll whichever are higher. So if the whites beat the other ones, it's something like that. I think it might be four success and they cancel each other out. Like Genevieve got it when she was six years old. Right. So it was really simple. Genevieve does not get My Little Pony, even now at nine years old. It's we, we haven't tried again. So we haven't tried since she was eight. We tried again when she was eight and it was it was difficult for her. She got the storytelling and telling a story, but why different numbers mattered or which die to grab. So that's the other difference is they're different size dice for different stats. Right. It, it's surprisingly crunchy, but I think that game is also trying to appeal to adults because there are an awful lot of adults that are My Little Pony fans. There are indeed. The bronies came up already in the uh, chat room. So there you go. No, it's it's totally true. Yep. So yep. I think they were trying to hit both sides of the spectrum with that right. game. Makes sense. Now, there are other kids' games out there. I'm just going with the ones I played. Uh, I personally think introducing the kids to role-playing games is fantastic. It, it's something, in my opinion, almost to do as early as possible. Just when you're really young, stick to the open storytelling, right? You just yeah. just tell stories together. Yeah, Be and involved. that's the thing. And that's what Shadzar was, was bringing up earlier, is really or that, that difference between rules and not rules. You know, storytelling yeah. versus structured storytelling. You don't want to start too much structure too early because right. you don't, for God's sakes, want to restrict their imagination in any way uh, as possible. Yeah, I totally agree. Like basically the evolution is just completely open role play, right? Like playing yep. pretend. Yep. And then you move it. What I would move to next is past the stick storytelling. So all you're adding there is uh, taking turns, right? So yep. it's the person who has the dice gets to tell the story. Then they pass the dice and now they tell the story. And then you move from there into your role playing games with, character sheets or the next thing i would add in is a conflict resolution system right i probably wouldn't even go to a full thing and be like all right when you tell your story do you know if that happens or not let's roll a d6 if you get one two or three it happens yep. four five six you got to tell a different you know it go it branches a different way and then eventually get to the full character sheet i mean realistically i wish we'd had dice with us when we were playing gi joe back in oh, the exactly. <laughs> you know yeah uh, it, well even the old story like i, I realized um you're, you're playing cops and robbers, right? Bang, you're dead. No, you're not. You throw yep. a D6 out there, and all of a sudden, you got a way to find out if you're dead or not. Or you get hit by a D6, but that's a whole different <laughs> <set>. <laughs> 
And then, uh, then I think it just evolves from there, right? Uh, yeah. I don't think we really need to keep going on this, but you're just going to slowly introduce harder games and you're going to judge it based on how the kids like it, right? Yep. Like how, how they're progressing. And if you have to take a step back, my kids still play some of those old habit games. Like I, we go through those games, we're like, you want to get rid of any of these? Like, oh, we can't get rid of kids of Carcassonne. I'm like, isn't that game a little simple for you? Oh, no, no, we love it. I'm like, yep. all right, cool. we'll yep. play kids of Carcassonne then. No, absolutely. Uh, every once in a while, my kids will still out. We play, we picked up a uh, Caillou memory game at one point. Um, and for some reason, they still like that. I, I don't like Caillou or really playing memory, but they still like it. So more power to them. I'm not going to, uh, it's, you know, that's a, that's a skill that you can always sort of work on and, and develop. So I'm not going to argue with them. All right, so we kind of talked about when to introduce games and a bit on what kind of games with a, a couple specific games mentioned. But now you're sitting down at the table. You've got the kids there in front of you. How do you keep them interested? How do you get them involved? Well, you know, for me, there's actually two different things here because keeping them interested and keeping them involved has, has two sides to it. And it depends a lot on their age and each individual kid. Uh, my daughter will sit there and play through an entire game. My son won't, but it's not because he's not interested. He's just a bundle of energy. He has a whole lot of energy. So I've actually gotten to the point now and I, and I realized, uh, thankfully early on before I, I accidentally put a stop to it is if we're playing a three player game of something, uh, when myself and my daughter are taking our turns, I let him get up and run around. You know, as long as he's not causing problems and, and he's not, you know, checking behind anyone's uh, cards, he's not disturbing the game. He's just burning off a little bit of energy and he comes back when it's his turn and he plays his turn and he watches and he, you know, and sometimes he does sit there and play and that's fine. He's still interested in the game. It's not because he's bored with the game. It's just because he has a lot of energy and doesn't want to sit for a long time. Yeah. Uh, and that's one of those things. So you've got to pay attention to the difference between interested and unable to sit for, you know, an hour or a half an hour or 45 minutes or an hour and a half. Um, uh, and I noticed that I've just noticed that with him, uh, specifically that he's interested. He just can't sit there. Right. Yeah. With, uh, with our youngest, we, we have to basically let her fidget. And the hard part is trying to get her to fidget with the right game components. <laughs> so, so she doesn't fidget with something important, right? right? Like whatever, if she's got a die that represents her health, it's like, no, no, don't play with that one because that one tracks her, yeah. her health. Right. So we've had her go grab other toys yeah. uh, to have at the table while we're playing. Um, I remember playing at the kitchen table and having just some Lego dudes so she could take them apart, put them back together, whatever, yep. when it wasn't their turn. So, and that's another thing too, is we, you're going to have to judge uh, how much players need to pay attention between turns. Cause in some games that matters a lot and other games, it doesn't matter. And with kids often, it doesn't matter is possibly a better solution. Yep. Like I know again for, D you know, DC, which is my, my go-to game right now, while you can definitely play better if you are paying attention to what your your opponents are grabbing card wise, there's also a, you can play just fine without it. Right. Um, so as long as you know what cards are out there, and and if you walk away and come back, you can see what cards are out on the table mm -hmm. and what you've got to buy. Uh, it doesn't matter as much at this point. Um, we're not playing super competitive, so the fact that they don't know what I bought is generally just fine. Yep. Uh, so other ways to keep kids interested, uh, I, this goes back to our other topic, which I'm not getting into, but pick the right game, right? Like, make sure you have fun, exciting games that they care about while you're sitting there to play. Uh, you want to keep your terms quick, right? Analysis paralysis is going to kill the game. Uh, that's true for some adults as well. But with kids, like, they just don't take it that seriously, right? It's a kid's game. It, it's not going to really matter that much if you win or they win. So don't take a lot of turn time. Um thinking but even more importantly let them make their own decisions so if they need to take a lot of time let them just on your side don't let them get bored on your turn do the quick move make a stupid move whatever just go so we can get back to them right try to keep the focus on them playing and again try not to make decisions for them or if they do make a bad decision you have two choices you can either point out it's a bad decision but even better if the game's the right type of game is you let it play through so they learn why it was a bad decision um just thinking back to chess right like when they move the knight in the one spot and they're about to lose their knight you could be like oh watch it remember this guy can hit him you're going to lose your knight you probably want to point that out but if it's two moves ahead that they made a bad move with their knight 
let them move their knight so they can see that, oh, maybe that was a bad choice because they're not thinking ahead. Mm -hmm. Not that we play a lot of chess here, but it just <laughs> it's a game most people know and recognize. Yeah. No, I like uh, checkers is another example that we my daughter loves and, and will play a lot of, you know, if she if she makes a move that's illegal, you know, if she's moved, yeah. moved something where, where she had to make a jump, I'll call it out. But if she's just moved something, she knows there's a good chance that I'm going to beat her anyway. So, you know, she just needs to learn that that was a bad move and daddy's going to, you know, jump three and, you know, <laughs> uh, and, and get it. So, uh, yeah, I try not to. There's a difference between wrong moves and bad moves. Yeah. Wrong moves you want to stop. You want to stop anything that's, that's breaking the game at, after a certain age. Again, or really early on, if they're just yeah. sliding pieces around on a checkers board and they have fun doing that, great. Uh, that, you know, in the, in the preschool age, but at a certain mm -hmm. point they need to start learning the proper rules. And so you need to put a stop right away to, you know, moving the knight in a way that the knights don't move. Yes. Um, but if it's a poor choice of moves, that's a whole different story. You know, I, mm -hmm. I firmly believe I, I don't coddle my kids. If I'm going to beat them, I'm going to beat them. Um, yeah, I was going to move on to that. that that's, yeah. that's basically the, the next point. Um, at an early age, I'm up for coddling. I'm like, all right, you, you can win, right? Especially if the kids have very bad reactions if they lose. I'm not saying to let them win every time. You do eventually have to teach them that it's okay to lose. But there's a thin line there, right? Because if they get that upset when they lose and they lose all the time, they're just not going to want to play games. So you still need them coming back to the table. Where what I would usually do is I would tell them I'm going to throw the game. Right. Like I'll, I'll point it out. I'm like, look, what you did there is not a good move. You're going to lose. Or if you move here, you can beat dad. Right. And I'll, I'll kind of help them beat me as opposed to, oh, look, dad made a dumb move. Even yeah. that is a little better than just throwing the game completely. But as they get older, no, I do not cuddle my kids. I don't let them win. I want them to play competitively. I want them to understand that playing games more gives you experience and that experience is rewarded. And they're not going to learn that if I let them win right off. Maybe. Where uh, chess is, again, the perfect example is my dad's like, you'll probably never beat me at this game. And to me, I saw that as a challenge. And I, I, I think I beat him maybe twice in my whole life, right? Like it did not happen often. And it, it was a challenge, right? It was him trying to teach me that this game requires skill. And until you develop that skill, you got no chance of beating me, kid. But he'd point out, oh, here's what you did wrong. Here's why you lost. You know, you lost on turn four. And I'm like, what? And he'd reset up the board <laughs> and be like, here's how you lost. And I'm like, oh, I can't think that far ahead. Yeah. No, chess tech definitely takes a certain amount. One of my, one of my struggles is I'm not a good enough chess player <laughs> to help my son enough. Uh, cause my son's actually been really interested in chess, uh, and, and just for fun the other day, I threw on finding Bobby Fisher, which is still a great movie. That movie still really holds up. Um, and he got all interested in chess again. He was e pushing me to play and I, and I had to apologize. I'm like, I'm not good enough at chess to help you get better. Yeah. Um, so we've got an iPad app that he really enjoys, uh, and it challenges him and it, it does not only games, but it does challenges, you know, it sets up a. A strategy and says, okay, what do you do here to win in four oh, moves cool. or whatever? Um, and, and I'm just not, I'm just not yeah. a good enough chess player to help him out with that. Um, so we, we, we've gone with the iPad route for him. Oh, uh, it's not a bad idea. Uh, and I probably not that good. I don't remember the last time I played chess. I don't yeah. even think my kids were alive the last time <laughs> I actually played chess. So it's been a long time. I have no kid idea if my kids would even be interested. Yeah. I think we have a chess board somewhere in the house, but I don't know where we have chess pieces. We've got to have some somewhere. I know yeah. we have the board. Now, one of the things I find that helps is uh, you don't, if you don't want to throw the game for your kids, and I completely agree, but you don't want your kids losing all the time, help out your kids play against each other. So that's where mm -hmm. dad plays, you know, the, the overseer of the two kids playing against each other. And you can help them both and help them both get play a better game. Uh, and one of them's going to win, one's going to lose, but it's them playing each other and it's not, you know, daddy beating up on, on the kids. Yeah, true. Uh, and so that's a great way to do it. Or, you know, if, if, you know, mom, mom helps one, dad helps another, dad helps one, the other dad helps another, however your yep. universe and, and family is set up. Well, that's great. Or, you know, if you only have one, you, you can take turns helping one or the other, but however, however your family is set up, helping your kids play if possible, or, you know, or if you're, if you've only got one child, bring a friend over and help them both play, you know, bring their best friend over and help them both learn a game. Uh, but not playing is a great way to help, you know, train them. And yes, as uh, Angie Game says, it helps them to keep them from coming to blows. So yes, you're, you're playing referee as well as uh, 
as game master involved there. And it's just, you know, that way you're, you're completely free and open to help everyone mm -hmm. equally. Uh, and you don't have to worry about uh, trying to win or, or feeling, feeling weird about beating your kids for the 16th time in a row. Yeah. That's one I probably should do more often. I don't tend to, it's not one I've really tried. Usually if they're playing, I just sit back and try to see if they're playing by the proper rules and I'll point out if they play something badly or, or right. they mess up something. And usually it's just, no, we know that and we're playing by our own rules, which is cool. Yeah. But I'm mean, usually that's it. I'll watch for a bit and I let them do their own thing. Well, and yours are, yours are at an age now where it's not necessarily, it's earlier yeah. on where that's more of a thing where, where they really don't mm -hmm. necessarily know the rules and they need someone to help them along uh, with rules and point out things more often. So we mentioned uh, about not coddling and all this, but what do you do when things go wrong, when it's going bad? And I know one of Sean's answers that's gotten a bit of flack in the past, but I think he's completely right. And it's something more adults should do is what do you do when that tantrum happens, especially mid game? Yep. You walk away. The game yep. is over. Uh, and, and, but it's also not just tantrums. If the game isn't fun, whether that's because someone's having a tantrum or because someone has gotten bored and decided it's not fun anymore, or a friend's come over and wants to go outside and get exercise. The game's over. Sometimes you leave it set up. Maybe you'll come back to it later. But for that moment, anyway, the game's over. Now, as you mentioned earlier, the thing to watch there, though, is to not make it so that every time the kid's losing, they just walk away because the game's over. Right. You don't want like, to teach the rage quitting mentality because if, if every time they lose, they know they can walk away from a game that That's... develops the concept of rage quitting. Uh, so to me, what you want to do is outside of the, the ability to stop a game, you want to work on that, that rage quitting, you know. You, do, you want to teach your kids that it's okay to lose. And that comes from a lot of these other earlier things we were talking about. Mm -hmm. Developing that, that playing mentality and the ability to take turns and play well with other people. Whether it's you playing the referee between your two kids or, you know, getting them used to the fact that daddy's probably going to beat you all the time because <laughs> daddy's better. Um, and that's okay. There's nothing wrong with losing. Uh, and getting that into their heads so that when you do teach them about ending a game when it's not fun it's not reinforcing the rage quit mentality yes the thing is i think is that the quitting the game should be a mutual decision it shouldn't be you decided you're done and you walk away it's right. no we decided we are done playing right yeah. now because you are no longer in a mood to play this game or you're no longer in the right headspace to play this game or you know what there's more important things to do right now why don't we put this aside right whatever yeah. that case is why can, why you're can we it? end this game now daddy yeah. not we're done now dad exactly yeah, it, it's definitely yeah it, it, absolutely you, it, walking away from a game is not ending a game walking away game from a game is rage quitting uh yeah. whereas I'm not having any fun anymore, daddy. Can we do this another time? Yeah, we, were, we worded that badly. We, we yep. shouldn't say walking away from the game. It shouldn't be walk away. It should be end the game. Yep. Mutually, mutually decide to end the game early. Yep. And again, adults do this too. Should mm -hmm. see this happening more often for multiple reasons. If you know the game's over in three turns, why play out those last three turns? Especially if it's a long game with three hours, it's going to take just to find out that the person you knew was going to win is still going to win. Yeah. Also yeah. important with the kids uh, when teaching the games, right? Sm teaching small chunks. So um, restart the game once they get it. We've talked yep. about that many times. Play through two turns once the kids have the game. Restart the game. Yep. And, and yeah, we like the quit the ending games. We've had you know we've talked about it on the show fast. Uh, Harry Potter uh, when we got into the monster box, it was obvious because we realized that there is a runaway problem in that game. The one time we got to that point and realized there's no way we're going to win. So mm -hmm. we can sit here for another 45 minutes and lose this game, or we can all put this game away and, and come back to it again later because we like it, not be angry with it because we sat around 45 for 45 minutes losing a game. We knew we were going to lose. Yeah. Um, and then with DC, you know, daddy likes DC a lot. There's, <laughs> <laughs> we all know that on this show. Yeah. Uh, and, and so I'll play three, four five games in a row, but my son doesn't want to do that. So he'll play, you know, sometimes he'll get into that second game because I think he knows I want to. But if it's uh, one of the longer uh, scenario or one of the longer games, um, a few times in, you know, he's gotten into it and gone, you know what, Daddy? I, I think one's enough for me. Yeah. Okay, we're done. And that, that drives to, I think, the, the most important thing about all of this is to remember, and uh, we're talking about gaming with kids, but I still swear this this applies 
to every game you sit down with a group of people to play. You are there to play a game and have fun. Whether that fun is doing a bunch of complex math in the back of your head to prove that you're better at economics than everyone else in Planet Steam, or that fun is rolling to move around a board or playing colored cards to get to the end of the track before someone else does, even if you don't, the, the order of those cards is predetermined. If that's what you do to have fun, that is the important part. You are there to have fun with your kids. And I got to admit, I'm bad at this one. I focus on my kids getting the rules right and playing the game and paying attention too much sometimes. And when I, I forget, and I look over and I see little G has taken her hit point stack and mixed it in with her damage stack. And now we have no idea what status her character's in. And I get frustrated by that because I take my gaming fairly seriously. Uh, it's it's on me. It's on the parents to remember that, hey, we're, we're having fun. We're supposed to be telling a story. We're supposed to be playing games together. I know I have this problem. I, I We talked about competitiveness. I talk about how I don't care if I win, but I play to win. Well, I play to win, right? So I'm focused even playing a co-op game. I'm like wait, we're trying to finish this story. Don't worry about that thing over there. Let's do the story. And I, I realize that takes something away from the game. Now, thankfully, my kids still love playing with us and we're still all good. I haven't ruined it yet, but I know if I keep it up, I do have that potential of turning them off playing games with us. Yeah, no, you have to remember that uh, the Oxford D uh, Dictionary defines game as a group of swans. Well, yes, but also oh. it, de it defines game as... An activity that one engages in for amusement or fun. Yes. And if you leave out that amusement or fun, that's just an activity, not a game. Oh, very true. Or it's an educational, uh, you're, you're sending your kids to class, and I, yeah. I think they probably get enough school as it is. Yep. Now, I, um, we basically covered everything I had ahead of time. So... Chat, here's your chance. If there's something you think we missed or something we can, should cover, bring it up. Uh, I'll throw it over to Sean to see if there's anything he made, because I made our little bullet points here for stuff I thought we was worth talking about. Is there anything you think we missed? No, I think we uh, I think we covered all the, the super important topics really there. I mean, again, it's, it's all about making sure that it's an enjoyable time. Yeah. And, and taking whatever steps necessary to make sure that, that it's enjoyable and it stays enjoyable. You don't want your kids to think of gaming as a chore. And I know you've mentioned this in the past that you don't agree with the game night. You know, like every yes. week we have Thursday night game night and I darn it, not. you're going to be here because Thursday nights we play games. Correct. Um, that's, that's not making things fun. Uh, it may be for a while, but once your kids have other things they want to do. Um, you don't want to, you know, force them to play games Correct. because that's what you always do. That's not fun anymore. Um, so do keep, you know, if you want to have a family game night, have a family game night, but make sure everyone agrees that we are going to have a family game night on mm -hmm. a night that we are all available, not darn it. You're going to be here Thursday night, no matter yes. what. Now you can say, you know what? Thursday nights are the nights we play board games. And then Thursday comes around, do you guys want to play board games tonight? Because teaching kids scheduling is good, right? Like, yeah. if you ever want a consistent role-playing group, you're going to have to pick that Thursday night or Wednesday night, right? So I'm not as opposed to it. I'm like, oh, you must play. It's the yeah. you must play. Yeah. That's the part you want to avoid. Scheduling's fine, right? Uh, my kids have things they do, right? Monday night is banjo. Tuesday night is scouts and art class. Wednesday night is music lessons. Thursday night, we go out for dinner. But wait, wait, there's time before dinner. So if we play board games, we're going to play Thursday night. Sounds good. Usually, though, what I do is I we're more freeform. We're more like, uh, hey, Sunday, do you want to play some games? Or, you yeah. know, I, usually it's Deanna or I will schedule, and the kids are usually more than up for it whenever we bring it up. But it's the, the I've seen it too many times where people do that. The, the Hasbro tried to push it, right? Family yep. game night. It was supposed to be a certain night of the week, and it's it's the forcing them, right? Don't yep. force your kids to play games. And you know what? It could be horrible. Ever you might be listening to this, and your kids are totally not into games. I I admit that does suck for you. I feel bad for you, but it's not every kid's gonna like everything you like, right? It's gonna be the same as um, anything else. They're probably they probably don't like the same music as you, and you're probably gonna hit that phase. And I'm sure I'll go through it soon, where my kids are gonna absolutely hate board games because they're the things that parents do, and I don't want to do the things that parents do. Yep. Now, if we go into our RPG talk, uh, Major Kayla was talking about a game of uh, My Little Pony that she played, where the co-GM was an eight-year-old and her dad was coaching her through DMing. 
Now, what oh, a so great goes, way. Yeah. Goes back to your playing with them. That is a great idea. I did more sink or swim with Big G, uh, letting her just kind of dive into it and and doing her own thing and then coaching her once I was at the table a little bit. Because um, we did have a horrible problem. Man, you want to talk about a railroad GM the first time she ran a game. But you know what? She didn't know any better, which I thought was interesting because with no prior RPG knowledge, she immediately went to railroad. So there's a, a bang against, in my opinion, the My Little Pony role playing game for teaching kids to railroad early. Right. I haven't read the rule book. She won't let she wouldn't let me read it. So. I, I haven't actually seen if it's that bad, but oh my god, it was one of those, you know, your your Call of Cthulhu thing where you don't find the clue. Uh, we we did everything we could to to keep this one event from happening, spending every resource we had, and it's one of those games that has um, poker chips for fate point type of thing. I don't remember what they're called in that game. Probably heart points or something like that. And like we we made amazing rolls and like rolled a natural twenty and did all these things and did all these things, and eventually I'm like, hey, G. Is it say that this has to happen? Because if it does, just have it happen. Don't wait for us to fail a roll because we have now passed like 12 rolls in a row using every resource we can to pass. And you keep stopping us even though we've succeeded. And sure enough, the scenario was as soon as the characters fail at this, this next step of the scenario happens. And if no one fails, that step never happens. Yep. No, it's uh, it's definitely a, a thing. And it, to be honest, I mean... At almost any age, uh, and Chadzar brings up, you know, playing with uh, multiple DMs works. We played con yeah. games where the the fully grown son was yes. helping his dad DM because they wanted that extra creative input. Mm -hmm. The dad was the, the GM and the son was essentially acting as a uh, sort of an assistant creative advisor yeah. to the dad. He was also keeping GM. track of names and stuff. He had the facts. Yeah. He had all the data, the character names and stuff like that to make sure his dad didn't mix up who was who and stuff. Yeah. So yeah, you can you can start that young and keep on. I mean, you could you could start gaming with your child yeah. and and grow up and end up gaming it with them at cons. So uh, I'm going to try to summarize this, which is always rough when I don't have a set of notes and we kind of improvise this, but. <laughs> Basically start as young as you can, as young as you want. Like, there's no reason. Like, give your your newborn a set of foam dice, right? But keep the rules to a minimum or none. Stick to improvising. Keep it light. Don't worry about the rules. Just engage with your kid. You're just trying to teach basic stuff. Uh, rolling dice, holding cards, taking turns, colors, shapes, memory, all those real basic things that you're trying to keep teach your kids anyway. You're just going to try to do it through games. As they get older, that's when you start putting in more rules and more restrictions, and that's when you focus on things like table manners and making sure you're you're playing properly and sore winners and sore losers. And one of the big tips there is to make sure to keep it fun. And when it's not fun, stop playing. Those are, I think, the two things we had to do, we got to there. There are a huge variety of games out there. We did two previous episodes where we talked about that. So if you do want those, you can check out way back to episode two when we talked about co-op games. So I'm sure we sound pretty lousy, <laughs> but I think the suggestions are still solid. Or episode 20, where we talk about hooking your kids on gaming. So this is how to get them at the table is mainly what we talked about and a huge list of suggestions of non-cooperative games to play with kids. But remember, it's all about having fun. It doesn't matter who wins. Going back to our competition episode, the point is to have fun. You should always play to win. We personally don't suggest letting your kids win. They have to learn to lose. Plus, it teaches them that experience matters and that game system mastery, game mastery, learning to play a game better is rewarded. Did I miss anything there? No, I think that about sums it up. So that's it, I, it for this week's Ask the Bellhop. If you'd like to read more about gaming and game nights topics like this, be sure to check out the blog at tabletopbellhop.com and click on Gaming Advice, where you will see plenty of topics answered in blog form. If you've got a question for us, head over to the website, click on Ask the Bellhop, or email me at questions at tabletopbellhop.com. Now it's time for us to check in with you live here in the lobby. We've had a lot of chat going on and some, uh, some fun discussion. Uh, personally, I like Shadzar's uh, suggestion of the RPG Honey Heist, uh, a oh, surprisingly that's... successful one-page RPG. You have a complex plan that requires precise timing. You are a goddamn bear, and that's <laughs> largely it. 
<laughs> yeah, that, that game is the first RPG that was ever published on a t-shirt. That's how Honey Heist was premiered at Gen Con, is the designer wore it on a shirt. There we go. Yes, the bellhop knows way too much obscure trivia about <laughs> games. As soon as I saw Honey Heist. I don't know, there's something in the chat about my wife being behind me with a with a rolling pin or a frying pin. Rolling pin? Yeah, rolling pin or frying pan. I, I miss part of that chat jumping over. Oh, I think. I do like the multiple DM sections. I saw Major Kayla noting they started the, I don't know if it was their kids or they played with kids who were five. I did notice that earlier, which is cool. Uh, Shadzar actually had a really good point that there should be no such thing as an RPG for kids. Just let them play. I totally agree until they get older. But again, make sure they're interested. Like if they just want to improvise, keep that up. There's no reason to stop that. Yeah, no, and absolutely. I said, Rory Story Cubes, if you want prompts and your kids are into anything, you can get a, a set of dice for anything. There's Batman, there's Doctor Who, there's actions, there's all kinds of these dice. And it comes with a set, I think, of nine dice. And the whole point is you roll them and you tell the story. And as you use the elements in the dice, you remove the dice. So you're trying to get rid of all the dice. And of course, there's a ton of different variants on that, right? Where you pass the dice to the next player and they have to use it and everything else. But like brilliant improv storytelling stuff. Like if you're into RPGs, you should own a set of these. If you're a DM, get a set of the actions. And the next time you're characters go off the rails and go to a town you didn't expect grab those Rory story cubes and roll them and there you got what happened in the end they're they're a fantastic tool i i own the batman set and then a couple of like the generic i think there's like actions and movements and travel i think are the three i've got yeah and at a certain point as much as i you know i fully encourage my kids to imagine all they want there's nothing wrong with introducing rules in certain situations mm -hmm. so here, at the table, we're going to have rules about our RPG, but when you guys go downstairs and grab Lego, there are no rules, and that's where you can do the freeform yeah. stuff, and, and having that separation uh, at a certain point isn't uh, the worst idea. Very cool. Yeah, makes perfect sense. And uh, I do correct by saying Major Kayla doesn't have kids with other people's kids. Right. Fair enough. Yeah, this isn't necessarily gaming with your kids. That's Gaming true. with anyone's kids. Gaming There's with nothing kids. wrong with tormenting your, uh, you know, your little ne nieces and nephews and teaching them how to game. And so that when you leave, you th their parents are forced to go out and buy Catan for their kids. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes. I, I'm sure there are parents out there that hate me for, for teaching their kids some games. Not that I've teach a lot of kids. My kids don't tend to have the friends over very often. It has happened, but not a lot. We keep growing with the support of fans like you, so if you haven't yet, please take a minute to subscribe, like, rate, review, click on the bell, thumbs up, or share to your friends. Wherever and however you find us, you can help us grow. Uh, sign up to receive Tabletop Gaming Week or Tabletop Bellhop Weekly in your inbox. Uh, once a week, I'll be sending out an email recapping all the content we've released in the week previous, blog posts, new podcasts, reviews, and anything else we create. You can sign up at newsletter.tabletopbellhop.com or go over to the tabletopbellhop.com webpage and you will find a spot to subscribe in the sidebar. All right, my guest episode of Onboard Games finally went live. It went live on Monday. They didn't even give me a heads up. I found out through Google notifications that Tabletop Bellhop was used somewhere out in the web. Uh, it's episode 346, which has the title of Welcome to Our World. Check it out. You can find onboard games at inversegenius.com. Now, I got to say it was awesome having Quiver, uh, Quiver Time as a sponsor last month. I just got to say, if you liked what we did for them, we are looking for new sponsors in the coming months. If you're interested in working with us, fire off an email to mo at tabletopbellhop.com. All right, time for our weekly Gloomhaven update. Uh, big spoiler for those of you who haven't caught up on our most recent episodes. I tell you to skip ahead, but you can't do that if you're watching live. Uh, plus, we don't put episode breaks. But you know what? We spoiled so much stuff in Gloomhaven at this point. I don't think it matters. But no, stop now. Go watch our recent, most recent episodes. Watch go. everything on YouTube and then come back and put this on. That'll work. So what happened was Tori finally retired Andre Stonebreaker, his Inox Brute, and at the start of our last session created his new character. Uh, we started off with that and wow, it was way longer than I thought it would be. It was a long process. I somewhat apologize to those of you watching because I don't know, that's something I think next time is going to happen off camera 
we're we're not going to watch people have us put cards back and Tori read through his cards for the first time. Well, it won't be Tori retiring next time. Next time, we'll finish the session with someone announcing their retirement, and the next one, they'll have their new character ready to go. I thought it'd be neat for people to watch. I, maybe I'm wrong. If you did watch it and thought it was cool, uh, let us know. Maybe we'll record it, but it was like an hour of us getting ready. In, I think in, in hindsight, we might want to try and do a separate episode of that. Yeah, um, if, po- if possible, if if that works, um, I know for for you and D, it would be easier. Whereas uh, you know, on a Thursday or something, you can record yeah. a record a uh, an unboxing and, and character development. Because yeah, I, I especially back to back editing the episodes, I actually just grabbed the footage for one and threw it into the previous episode to make things fit nicely. Oh, there and, you go. <laughs> and then realized that the the second the second episode was like three times as long uh-huh. as the quick episode we'd had the week before. Yeah, so. I, it, it it was it was long. So yeah. I apologize if you if you showed up for that and got bored and left. I uh, didn't quite expect it to take that much work to make a new character. The problem was you level up, right? So uh, as Gloomhaven's prosperity goes up, the higher level your new characters start. So our prosperity is three. So not only did Tori have to open a new character, which that part was cool, and see an awesome new mini, which totally was not what we expected based on the spiky head symbol that was on his box. We were expecting something totally different, but it was reading all the cards. And then he, once he learned the cards, he had to then pick four perks. And like with a brand new character you've never used, how do you know what perks you want when you don't even know what your cards are? And then he had to pick four new car, three new cards. And like, there was a lot more to it than we thought. And then we're like, oh, we're ready to go. He's like, oh, wait, I still have to go shopping for equipment, right? Like it just compounded into a very long drawn out process that next time we will be cutting out. So... Uh, our new character, the new character we have unlocked is the Orchid Dune Seeker, which he named Arrow something. I don't and, know. Maybe. And I dubbed Crystal Flower Sniper. Yes, the <laughs> Crystal Flower. I, I don't remember the last name he gave it. Um, once all that was good and done and we had our new minis out and everything, we did move on to Scenario 31, uh, Plane of Night. This follows the adventure path from when we went to the plane of elemental, I want to say elemental evil, that's a D&D thing, elemental something, in the temple of the elements, it was a big demon dude, and we kicked his butt, and then we went and stole the artifact that he originally wanted us to get, which was kind of amusing, and we brought the artifact to Hale, and Hale was like, now you have to go to the plane of night, and she like teleported us there. Um, wow, what a mess that was. Now, I don't know if it was the fact we lost our biggest tank. Like, my character's a tank, but Tori was much bigger, did way more damage, more of a tank. Uh, could have been because we had a new level three character with us. It could have been the fact that Tori was just learning how to play that character. Uh, could have been the rest of us had no clue how to work with the new character. It could have been dumb luck or something else. But, man, we got spanked. Like, really spanked. We got destroyed. Uh like we probably shouldn't have got the last room. We just opened it so that it was open. So we kind of got to see what was in there. Like we, we really shouldn't have got that far. It was bad enough that, uh, we spent a lot of time talking at the end of the game about dropping back to easy level. Um, Tori actually thought we were still playing on easy and didn't realize we had stepped it up at some point. Um, like maybe, maybe we'll go to easy until Tori's new character gets a couple of levels and we figure out how to get our four player party to work together again because we've mentioned it before playing four player gloomhaven is playing on extreme mode not cheating extreme mode on hardest difficulty hardcore mode uh it's considered the hardest so playing on easy may be the best choice i'm not sure uh usually though when we feel fail right like you we sit there at the end of the game like oh i should have did this or if i had only taken this card or if i had had this item on me no like this time we're like i don't know what we do different uh, there was a bit of a vermling rush ahead at the start of the fight, but really after that, uh, Deanna just hung back. So I don't think that had a real long term impact on it. I, I didn't really see anything that we did obviously wrong. Yeah, no, I, I think honestly for, for me as a, as a third party viewer, it, it felt like it was really more about the new dynamic. Um, it's just hard to integrate a new player or character in this case in mm. when they have a completely different style than both you're used to having in the team and they're used to playing. Um, yeah. So it really it really balances the the dynamic. Uh, the only thing I I can think of is <clears throat> I saw a lot of information about rushing. Um, so it feels like getting to the end. I don't want to throw too much spoilers in there, but but getting to that yeah. that thing that needs to be damaged at the end. Yeah, it seems seems like to the, really be the, the, thing. the requirement thing. 
Um, and it's interesting, like, you know, again, when I was looking up some FAQs during the, uh, during the game and you guys were suffering so much, I kept seeing people talking about stun potions and you guys were like, what are stun potions? I've never yeah. even used those. Um, so I don't so know. It, it seems like there's a bunch of the town. It's one of those things where there's, there's a depth to this game that, uh, you know, different squads and people can really go in different mm -hmm. ways because, uh, you know, online there's a bunch of people talking about this technique that you guys have never even considered. Nope. Um, uh, so we used. Uh, and yet, need it until now, I guess. Yeah, no, exactly. So it's interesting that, and maybe you don't need it, maybe there are other ways yeah. around it, uh, but it's just interesting seeing that the game really does have enough depth to have that sort of uh, variety between play groups. Well, really, like, what we, I don't even know if we really mentioned it before. What, what Gloomhaven really is is a gigantic multiplayer puzzle with a ridiculous number of possible options given the hand of cards that all the players have, right? And trying to solve that puzzle without knowing everyone else's hand, which is why it's easier if you play with open information, is, is very difficult at times. It, it's not what you expect from a dungeon crawl. It's not go in and get lucky on your dice rolls. Yeah. It's not that kind of game. It's It's definitely a puzzle. Yeah, you're, if you want to, if you want a real dungeon crawl, there are other games that are better. I think yeah. uh, Descent, I think, and, and, mm -hmm. and such, where it, it's it's it is a dungeon crawl, uh, yeah. whereas this is puzzle. Yeah, it's it's much more of a Euro game. So now the important thing we do have to announce is it is going to be quite some time before we get back to our main campaign in Gloomhaven. Uh, my wife, Deanna, and she games in the chat is heading into some serious surgery tomorrow. And that means she's going to be away from the game table for an extended period of time. Uh, possibly, hopefully not as long as two months. Uh, we're hoping it'll be a lot shorter time than that, but it is going to be quite a few weeks before she's back. So in the meantime, though, for those of you who do dig watching us play, Tori, Cat, and I still plan on getting together on Friday nights, and we do plan to stream something. Now, it may or may not be Gloomhaven. Uh, Tori and Cat basically requested doing a couple, excuse me, a couple of random dungeons. For one, to get Tori leveled up and more used to his character. Uh, the other thing they suggested, which I actually think may be a good idea, is having me basically play Dungeon Master so that just Tori and Cat can play. Because Cat is way behind on XP, and I am way ahead of everyone. Yeah, so that jumped. might help off, like, reset, rebalance the group so that we're closer together in level, which may also affect the difficulty. Because, I don't know, I get tons of XP every time I play. Like, I'm at level 7, and Tori's at level 3. That's a 4-level gap there. So that's one thing we might do. Or we may just play something else and stream it. Uh, I think it's probably still worth checking out. Just you won't be getting our regular Gloomhaven's continuing campaign. Now, talking about the XP, because, I mean, this has been an ongoing thing where you've just always been ahead of everyone else. Mm -hmm. Is it the Craig card or is it the, the, the you know, the, the card, the cards you pull for every adventure you all, you get that special thing? No, no, um, that doesn't give XP. No, that doesn't. Okay. No, that gives check marks. So it's all cards. It's all card play. What cards okay. I'm choosing. Like the one thing we, we had a conversation with cat about this is supposedly her character class the spell weaver is supposed to be the easiest to level up but she's somehow the lowest level character so i don't know interesting it, it's it's a play style thing it's what card she chooses to bring to the table i don't know i find it really easy to level up and it's gotten even easier because if anyone's watched us play every time i make rocks fall i get xp and that card's not burnt so, right. and I like that card and I have potions that let me pick up more cards. So I like to drop rocks on them and then use a potion to pick up drop rocks on them and drop rocks on them again, right. and then take a short rest so I can then drop rocks on them again. It's kind of what I do. And those all give XP. And then when I get bored and can't do anything, I have another card that lets me destroy objects and it gives me one XP. And then I just go smash all the rocks I just dropped or altars or whatever else happens to be around. And there's no real reason for me to get rid of those obstacles, but it gives me XP. So anytime I'm in those situations where I'm like, I can't reach any bad guys. All right. I headbutt something. Right. So I don't know. I, it's it's based on card play. I, I have noticed Cat is getting a lot more XP lately. So I don't know if it's card selection or what it is. Good to know. Now, no matter what they're actually going to play, remember you can watch the group play every Friday at 8.30 p.m. Eastern at twitch.tv slash tabletopbellhop, and if they play Gloomhaven, you'll catch the video on YouTube the following Thursday afternoon. Non-Gloomhaven non videos will go out uh, on Saturdays, but we aren't going to give you any definitive uh, answers yeah. for when that'll actually happen. But Saturday, well, Saturdays what? is our random, uh, our random gameplay playthrough uh, day.
So the other thing I'm doing now, too, is our Gloomhaven updates. I am posting a separate blog post on the blog. So if you head over to tabletopbailhot.com, they're in the on the table or on our tabletop. I renamed everything. I keep got, I got to remember I renamed some of it. On the on our tabletop section, you'll find our Gloomhaven recaps, where basically you get a written version of what I just told you. Um, but there's also a link to the YouTube video, so you can watch it right from there, so you don't have to go searching for it on our YouTube channel. And now, Tabletop Gaming Weekly, where we look back and summarize what's happened since we were last here. What games hit our tabletops? Uh, every week, we like to take a look back at the games we played, any events we attended, and other cool gaming stuff that's been going on. You can catch our version. No, that's not it at all. That's not it at all. I'm <laughs> you can catch the blog version of This Week in Review at tabletopbellhop.com under On Our Tabletop. Hey, sounds good. So I just had one game this week, uh, and it was with the kids, so it fits in well with what we're talking about, and that is Stuffed Fables. Uh, yeah. I played uh, the multiverse for DC uh, card building, de deck building, DC <laughs> comic. I, I played the multiverse for DC comic books deck building game. There you go. Something like that. Uh, so stuff fables. Uh, there's a bit of story behind this one. So we were talking about games and with kids earlier and potential problems. And I, here is one that came up with my personal family. So I really want my kids to like games, right? I'm a huge gamer. It's a big part of what I am and I want them to be part of that. So I tried to introduce games as early as possible with my kids. And in many cases that was successful in some cases, not so successful. Now there was a game that came out and I don't have the year in the top of my head. I'm going to say 2014 off the top of my head and I'm maybe right, may not. And that is game is mice and mystics was released by plaid hat games. Now this is before they merged with another company. I think they're now part of the whole Asmodee fantasy flight thing. Um, back when they were an independent company and this game just sounded like something my kids would love. And what the premise was, is it was a fantasy story. So knights, dragons, medieval, multiverse type of multiverse uh medieval universe type of thing and what happens is it's a story game where you read through chapters of a storybook and then play out sections of it and then that'll lead you to other chapters and sometimes it's branching paths and what happens right at the beginning of the story is an evil wizard shows up or it's a queen evil witch i can't remember which it's been a while since we played this shows up some magic user shows up and turns the prince and his retinue into mice and then turns the guards into rats. And that's how the game starts is you are these mice and you have just, well, you are these prints and it's retinue, just got shrunken down to mice. You're in the middle of the kitchen. What do you do? Where do you go? And you end up playing out this adventure where you're playing the guards, the mouse guard, or not mouse guard. Um, you're playing the mice in this game. And it's a miniature based dungeon crawl. So fantastic looking miniatures, amazing story, really well written story, very well produced game. Uh, lots of neat mechanics about cheese building up each turn to use special abilities and getting new weapons, leveling up, finding new characters, everything you'd want in an adventure game with a theme and background that sounds like it's perfect for kids. Now, the problem was. I introduced this to my kids way too young. This is a fairly complicated dungeon build, dungeon delver um, up there with games like Descent. Not quite as difficult as that, but getting close. And I like its weight's got to be up there, I will say, going back to the last episode. It's, it's not a simple game. So it has a theme that applies to kids, but itself, I would not say is a kid's game. Now, I had heard a bunch of people saying it's awesome to play with their families, and it kind of worked. Like, we had fun. My kids had fun. They've asked to play it since, but I basically declined and said, no, nah, let's play something else right now, because I recognized that it was too complex for them. Um, they're possibly at the age now they might get it better, but especially little G just didn't get it like there were there was too much reading there was too much information on the cards she was asked to read she had a handful of items to pick from plus the game was difficult because it is a tactical co-op miniature battle game really it's a dungeon crawl the if you beat the dungeon you read the next passage type of thing like there's an adventure where a cat might step on your mice it's, it's very well done but just way too much 
So it's a game I, I shelved. I, I don't know when exactly I was planning on pulling it back out. I hadn't gotten to that point yet. And then Plaid Hat Games released a new game called Stuffed Fables. This was a new thing using a system they called the Storybook System. Immediately, the internet exploded with this game saying, this is the new Mice and Mystics. This is the game we wish Mice and Mystics would. This is a real family adventure game for kids. So I picked up a copy of it, gave it to the kids for Christmas this last year, and we finally got to play this last weekend or on Monday. Actually, we played Monday morning and everything I heard is right. It is so much simpler. It is so much easier to teach. The story is even more accessible to kids because, oh, my God, is this not cute? The entire point is the girl, the, the, the kid, the, the girl, they don't name her, just moved from her crib to a big girl bed for the first night. And you are playing her stuffed animals that have to defend her from the stuff under the bed. And that is the premise of the game. Like, that is just such a fantastic premise for a game. And then this one, the whole thing with the storybook system is you have this really big spiral bound book with really thick pages. And that's because you open it up and the pages become the board. So you open it up and you read through the story and then eventually you're going to open it up and get a board with a map with a grid on it. And that's what you're going to put your miniatures on. Now, I'm not going to get into too much more detail here. I reviewed it. I, I did a first impression. It's not a review yet. I've only played once on the blog. But it's just a much simpler system. It's dice based where you're pulling dice out of a bag. The different colored dice let you do different things. So red dice are for attacking, green are for ranged attacking, uh, yellow are for searching, blue are for special tasks. They don't tell you what. White is for finding more stuffing, which is your hit points. Black are threat dice that make the bad guys go. Um, the story is fantastic. And what I was really, really pleased with, which is, I think, the biggest selling point that I didn't hear anyone else mention before, is it's not all combat. It's not set up the map, put the miniatures on the board, and win. This, the first adventure, yes, it starts off some creepy crawlies come out from under the bed and you have to defeat them. But that just teaches the game mechanics. The next thing that happens is all of a sudden you're on a heap of toys and you need to rush to jump on a train. And then the next thing that happens is we were bouncing down a pile of toys in a uh, what's it called? Radio flyer style red wagon. And there were no bad guys to fight. It was just trying to survive on this red wagon. And there were different ways it could have went. If we had caught the train, one thing would have happened. And if we did this other thing, we could have went to a town. And it was so much better an experience than Mice and Mystics. Almost enough that I may not unshelf Mice and Mystics eventually. Though I am really interested to know where that story went. This was just such a better implementation as a family game. No, it's really interesting, and I know uh, I took a po uh, peek in the box last time I was down, and that that fold flat uh, book is beautiful, oh. uh, really beautiful. The miniatures, uh, Angie Games points out, are really creepy, but gorgeous. I yeah. mean, they're really gorgeous. There are definitely some in there that you know some kids could conceivably get some <laughs> odd feelings from. Uh, yeah. It's uh, I, I, the game is eight, and I think player recommendation or eight. Uh, the recommendation is seven on Board Game Geek. Uh, for age, so you don't want to introduce it too early, but you know, you know, seven or eight's not uh, unreasonable. Uh, the other thing that's really nice are those uh, the the little cards, uh, the player turn and attri and attribute dice yes. cards. Yep. They're really clear. It's really obvious, and every player gets their own copy of what you know what the, you do in the turn and what all the different mm -hmm. colored dice mean and everything. Uh, so that's yep. that's a great feature. There is one other thing though I need to bring up because this is something that totally surprised me is we played for three hours and did not finish the first story. Ooh. So that is rough. That is something I had no clue. So every time I'd seen pictures and Sean even looked at the book, I assumed you played that one map and that one page that tells you all the keys for that map and you're done and you put the game away. No, that's page one of a multi-page story. We did three pages and it took us three hours. Now, that did include rule teaching. That did include severing everything up. Plus, it was the first time we played. So we were a little slow. I would say you could probably get that down significantly to a, probably about two hours. But we didn't finish the first story. And I don't know how much more it had to go. I would hope only one or two more pages. But it, it's, it's a long game, which that's a big ask for your kids. So one of the things you can do is at the end of any page, you can save the game, but there's no nice way to do it. 
You literally have to write down which sleep cards you flipped over, how much stuffing every stuff he has, what items every stuff he had, which people you've encountered. Like it's a lot of bookkeeping if you can't just leave the game set up. So that is a fair warning. One story takes a long time. One page of a story is quick, but three pages of a story took us, I'd say, an hour each. You could probably get that down to 45 minutes a page. Um, no, I do have a kid that gets distracted easily, so we were a little slower than the average, I think. Uh, Playtime on Board Game Geek said 90 minutes to, I think it said 60 to 90 60 minutes. 60 to 90. Which, I don't know. I don't see how you can get a full story in 60 minutes, but 90 is probably possible. So, fair warning. Uh, expect to have to save the game somehow, making lots of notes, or I guess you could probably use your cell phone, take pictures of everything, because, you know, we live in the future, and I tend to forget that. Um Playing the second time, I'll know. We've only played the one time. Now, playing through the second time may be different. Because it did take a bit to get my kids to realize what the different colors meant, right? Like, what the different dice were. Um, there's a really neat rule where when you're doing an action, you can use single dice or you can add your dice together. Which is really neat, actually. That's one worth mentioning, because I'd like to try this in some RPG system someday. So, your difficulty is five to succeed at something. And you have three red dice. You have a choice. You could roll your red dice and hope to get five or six. And you could do that three times. So you could take three actions to do it. Or you could take two of your dice and add them together, but then you only get to try twice. Or you could take all three dice and roll once, but you only get to try once. And I thought that was really neat. I've never seen that in another game. So even for movement, right? Like you could take all your, your movement dice and roll them together to move really far at once. Or you could take your time and move multiple times, which I thought was cool. So length, uh, there's actually a number of discussions. I was just looking through the forums on BGG, and, and there are definitely a number of discussions about how long this game is. Uh, a lot of people seem to, uh, the people who, who aren't, you know, the, the hardcore people who are willing to sit down and, and play through one, or, or, you know, the hardcore gamers who figured out how to do it in, in two hours, uh, are generally doing one to two pages per session. Yeah, so you have to break it up, it seems yeah. like. That seems it does to be seem a, like, which, which is something I had no clue going in. So yeah. that, that was something that definitely I did not not hear any forewarning on. Yeah, two. Uh, I see one here. You know, two players, just one and a you know, and a six year old daughter is four hours per story. Four hour per, per story. Two, two player, two players, four hour per story. Wow. Yeah, so, that's long for a kids game, right? It is, like, especially, especially with a six year old starting at, at <laughs> seven years old, right? Yeah. So that's that's the other thing I should ask you if, if you're willing to divulge that information. We probably should have said this at the top. My kids are uh, nine and eleven at this point. Yeah, and so, mine minor minor nine and twelve. So. <laughs> Uh, we, we, to be probably, 10 12. we probably we probably should have mentioned that when we were giving suggestions earlier. <laughs> True. Uh, we've mentioned it in the past, though. We have talked about that yeah. in other games, in other gaming episodes. Now, for me, uh, I got the multiverse box for uh, DC on there. And now I've talked about this before. I bought it because uh, I thought it was going to be a good way to hold all the different mm -hmm. uh, groups I bought. Uh, it isn't. It's, it's a mediocre way of holding all the cards. Um, it has the space but is pretty poorly constructed. So if you're looking for a way to hold your cards, Quiver Time has some uh, great <laughs> options. The multiverse, not so much. But the other thing the multiverse has is it has, it's its own expansion. Uh, it does come with a, an expansion. And not only that, its expansion is designed to make use of whatever expansions you have. Interesting. So one of the things it comes with is actually a randomizer deck with almost, not all, I guess there have been some released since the multiverse was published, uh, but cards representing all the different uh, expansions, then you pick out the ones you don't have and put them aside, and then you, during the game, you will shuffle this deck and pick a random expansion to take cards from. Uh, that's the easy part of it. Uh, that's the end of the easy parts of it. Mm. Uh, setting up the game with me, with the rule book in front of me, still took me probably, you know, 15 minutes of figuring out all the different things because you've got to pick a, your main character uh, and you actually pick from three and it turns out that you get rid of the other two and you don't ever need them again, but they never actually say that. I just kind of figured out when I got to the end of the book and they'd never mention them again. Uh, and then you've also got a stack of heroes that you work with. Uh, so similar to Rivals, you're actually attacking other players and those characters, not your character, but a set of different characters off to one side. Wow. Uh, and there are actually becomes two rows uh, up on the uh, table for cards to buy from uh, and a separate set of cards. So there's a stack of villains 
So you can also attack the game, but then there's also a set of events which trigger the second row. I mean, I, wow. I, I could go on and on. It, it's really complex. Mm. And the rule book was very badly written. I was not, you know, I was sitting down and the kids were trying, sort of trying to start playing before I was done getting through it all. And, but, you know, because the rule book was so complex, I just sort of said to say, look, let, let daddy figure this out because wow. it isn't making sense to me. And I'm having trouble mm. just getting this set up for us. Um, and then once we got started, we discovered that the character my daughter had up as one of her champions had a complete runaway ability that doubled the amount of power she was able to gain every turn from turn one, meaning she could get double the power cards throughout the entire game. And there was no chance we had to defeat her character because uh -huh. she was able to defeat our characters so far before we were able, even able to attack. Um, it was a complete runaway. Now it was that wow. specific character, uh, but it was at the point where halfway through the game, I was going through BGG trying to figure out if we were playing this wrong because it yeah. seemed insane that you would give one character this much extra power from game one. And as to the best of my knowledge, I, I I'm happy if someone is able to correct me on this, but uh, as far as I could tell, the ongoing power from that character was active and it was a complete runaway. There was no way we could have beaten her from game wow. one. Wow. So this one's purely competitive? Uh, yeah, this one is purely competitive. Uh, so it's, but it's, it's, it's strangely competitive because it's competitive against the game and against each other. Mm. Um, there's a way to end the game early by beating everybody else. Or if you play all the way through, it's victory point, uh, victory point count but we didn't get anywhere near playing all the way through. It was that much of a, wow. Yeah. So overall, nothing redeemable about that box at all. Uh, not really. Um, I, I, you know, I've held off playing it cause I knew that the, I, I just, by glancing at it, I knew the instructions were, you know, mm -hmm. enough that it was, it was a little more complex. Um, but I can't imagine ever really being willing to, oh, I might, I might throw some of the other cards into, into right. something else. Um, so there's that. But as a standalone, I have no real interest in playing that uh, that version of it ever again. Oh, fair enough. They can't all be winners, I guess. No, 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 absolutely not. It's just this one because it was a bad box and a bad game. I feel doubly disappointed yeah. by uh, by this one. So taking a quick jump over to the pile of shame count, uh, Stuff Fables was new. So that comes off. I had it on my list, even though it was a kid's game. So that one gets to come off the list. Um, probably going to be a while before any more pile of shame games come off. No, there'll be some next week. No, we'll be good. Okay. It's still going slowly. It's getting to the point, though, it's going to be a bunch of two-player war games that I probably won't get off the pile anytime soon. Uh, just this past week. Uh, Deanna and I were talking about doing a two-player game night, so I grabbed the rules for Hannibal, Rome versus Carthage. Wow. That's <laughs> that's all I can say is I, I am not a big war gamer, and wow. Elephants. So, yeah. The, where are the elephants? elephants. Yeah, spoiler, we, we, spoiler, no, no spoilers for uh, for Game of Thrones. Yeah. Um, we we, uh, we talked about, um, and when we're talking about game weight and rule books with section 1.5.6, it's one of those. <laughs> the one that blew me away is there is not a single picture of the board anywhere in the rule book. Oh, so I'm trying to read this stuff about how um, if this character is in play, he comes into play in this city unless the city's under siege and then this happens. And I'm like, I, I can't picture this. Like I need, I would need to set up a game to even be able to figure out the rule book. And I'm just like trying to, you know, force my way through the book to the end and then maybe go back. And I'm like, this is going to be one where I'm going to have to find a video. And eventually we just, we didn't play it. We were just like, eh, maybe eventually, which, which, which game is this Hannibal Hannibal Rome versus Carthage. Uh, when, okay. When I first got into board game geek, this is back when Tigris and Euphrates was the number one game on board game geek, Hannibal Rome versus Carthage was a top five game. So at one time I decided I wanted to own all of the top 100. So I managed to get a copy of this game because it's supposed to be one of the best war games. At least back then it was. I've noticed it's dropped significantly, but it's still up there, if I remember. Uh, it's 12 in the war and yeah. 170 overall with a 3.43 weight. So yeah, that see, I play four weight games, but this seems the rule book is 
the as we talked about last episode you talked about uh the rule book adding to the weight well at this point it feels like a four weight or a 4.5 trying to learn it from the rules right well it sounds like just judging by looking it's one of those things where if you're an avalon hill gamer you're yeah. you're more comfortable it, it seems like it, it pulls from other avalon hill uh the themes okay. and, and then mechanics. So if you're an Avalon Hill person, it's probably that much easier than if right. you're coming fresh into it as a non Avalon Hiller. I don't know. It's, it's one, it's again, I want the oral tradition. I need someone who knows the game to teach it to me. I yeah. may try to do it through video, but man, fighting for that rule book is something else. Well, and it's an older one too, right? 1996. Yeah. Uh, it's a very different rule book style than a, than a 2018 game. Well, the one I have is a, is a modern reprint thing by, oh, okay. I think, Valley Games. But it's it's one of those games that was popular enough that different companies have put it out over the years. Right. So now we talked about what we played. Is there anything you're looking to get to the table in the next week? Uh, for me, it's uh, mostly BGA. I uh, And I'm playing a little bit more Ascension again uh, yeah. when uh, when work isn't killing me, but I've been stuck in front of the computer, so it, it's mostly been... Uh, that, uh, and then we added, uh, a new game of, what did I say it was? Saboteur. Um, Saboteur in, um, and it's another sort of hidden trader game. Yeah. We'll see how it is. Yeah, on it's, BGA. It's, it, I don't see playing hidden trader games on BGA. I, I yeah. played Saboteur a long time ago with Jamie. He used to bring it out to events. So the green bean, it was popular. Uh, those type, it's, uh, those style of games are usually good to get to know new gamers. It, it was okay. Not, yeah. not something I rushed out to buy, but everyone pretty much knows my thoughts on social deduction games. So it's not something I have in my collection. Right. So for me with Deanna out of the house, I expect to be playing more games with the kids. Uh, I won't be Stuff Fables because we want to play all four of us. Uh, that's the other thing I should note about Stuff Fables. Well, I'm way out of order here, so anyone listening is probably going to get confused if for editing. But we have decided we did not save the game. So we're just going to restart from the beginning because now we know the rules a little better. Plus, uh, one of the things I need to do better is go through the kids' sheets and make sure they understand all their powers. Instead of realizing, all oh, my kids can read now. Obviously, they're going to know what all these terms mean. You know, again, my bad. It's something I need to learn is to, to not make them sink and swim quite as badly. Right. So make sure they understand everything about their characters. Because we had a character, there's, there's no death in the game, but we had a character become unconscious that shouldn't have had to use the powers on the cards properly. So we're going we're gonna to re restart from the beginning. And as and she gains points, as Deanna points, we expected the 11 year old to know how to tank already. And that, that that's a skill that has to be learned. So yep. <laughs> we're, we're going to teach her how to tank better for the next game. So yeah, we're restarting from the beginning. So we are looking forward to playing it again, but we want all of us, we want Deanna back at the table before we play. Uh, one I've been thinking, uh, just based on the fact it's been on sale a bunch, but it's a game I already own, is I'm thinking my kids would probably love Survive Space Attack. And this is an old classic game where Atlantis is sinking. And you're trying to get your guys out on boats to get to different islands. And it's a family game. The kids would enjoy it. Well, it's a modern retheming of it to make it that it's a space station that's under attack and falling apart. And both my kids dig sci-fi, especially my youngest. So I'm thinking they might dig that. Uh, also, this Saturday coming up is a night at CG Realm. So I'll won't be all kids games for me. Uh, Strasburg is one I'm kind of hot on right now. So I'll probably be bringing that one out, but I don't know what else. All right. And I noticed the uh, the summary for Rome vs. Cartridge is three pages of four-column text. Yeah, that doesn't surprise <laughs> that's me. That's the summary. <laughs> yeah. And that's only a three-point something? Yeah. Uh, we'll three, see. four, five? Yeah. That's surprising. I'm surprised that's not higher. That's, that's all the war gamers going. There's no hexes. There's no chits because that's one thing that surprised me is your military units are just a number. You just have a stack of them, right? So right. you have three military units. There are 15 military units. There's no and there's no differentiation for different unit types. So I have a feeling all the hardcore war gamers are probably rating it a weight of one because how do you have Roman armies where you don't have legionnaires versus sharpshooters versus cavalry or something? I don't know. Yeah, that's I mean, because I mean, battles, political control, sieges, and subjugation, special oh, yeah. ability, sudden death victory. Oh, yeah, it just, it's. It, it looks heavy. It looks, it look, I, eh, I, I'm willing to give it a shot. Yeah. I, I, I dig heavier games. It's just learning. War games are different to read. There, there's yeah, a different yeah. mentality required. Absolutely. All right. 
All right, I'm a bit out of order here, but I did mention I did want to talk about Builders of Blankenberg, so I'm going to keep this short. Uh, Builders of Blankenberg, I've talked about it. I was playing that fantastic hidden gem Euro game that I honestly think would have been a bigger deal if it wasn't put out by an independent publisher. That publisher is Cobblestone Games. I think if a Mayfair or a Rio Grande or an Asmodee had put this game out, more people would be talking about it. Well worth checking out. Uh, that you can find online. But really what I want to talk about is a new expansion called Fields and Flocks and what it adds to Builders and Blankenberg. So I'm not going to recap Builders and Blankenberg. I've talked about it in previous episodes. But what Fields and Flocks does is it adds a worker placement aspect to the game. Now, this greatly increases the weight of the game and the game length. I would say it doubles the game length because there's that much more to think about. What it's adding are two new resources, two new things to manage, which are fields and flocks. So you have serfs. You start with one surf at the start of the game. And after the income phase, after all the people come to town, you get paid for where they move in and where they stay. You then are going to use your serfs to do things. Your most basic action, of course, is hire more serfs. Like any worker placement game, you can get more workers. The other thing you do is you can buy a field or a flock. Once you have a field or flock, you get a card that represents it, little hobbit size cards. And it comes with a bunch of water on it. The water represents you having to toil the land or tend the field or flock. You do that with serfs on future turns. You play a surf, you get to remove water. Once all the water is gone, your field or flock is ready. Once your field or flock is ready, you can now use your serfs to sell the items those produce to the citizens in town. I thought this was cool because it adds something to me that fits this theme of a growing medieval village, right? Being able to tend your flocks and then sell your animals to the various people in town. Very thematic. It ties in really well. Or selling your grain. The other thing you can do, though, is nearing the end of the game, what you're going to want to do is attach these to buildings. Now, this is obviously a little more abstracted, but it lets you take your field or flock and attach it to one of the buildings that's already built. Now, when you do that, you get victory points instead of money. Um, and victory points is big in that game because it's not a high scoring game, but it uses up one of your serfs for the rest of the game. So it's like a farmer in Carcassonne, right? You're taking a risk by using up all your serfs. Very neat new things. There are some little rules tweaks that are in there for the core game. It does now let you play six players. It does add some new citizens and some new nobles that you can play at the beginning of the game. So there are some little things in there. Uh, the rule fixes, I think, are fantastic. Overall, I really dig the expansion. Uh, it takes what's in Builders of Blankenberg and adds to it. Uh, yes, the thing is, it does like double the length. So if you liked how quick Builders of Blankenberg is, for any of you who have played it, this probably isn't for you. But if you dig Builders of Blankenberg and want more, I strongly recommend this expansion. Now, I will admit there is one problem I have with it, and that is regarding one specific building, which is the convent, which requires you to... Um, the new cards are going to say genders on them. There's rule complexities and there's, I, I would just say in 2019, there, there are gender issues in the game that I don't think belong in this game. And I personally think they should pull the convent from it. As far as I can tell, I don't think they did. But other than that, there is one card that, and there's an awful lot of white people coming to this town. That That is something I expect better of in 2019, though it is something we're all kind of used to now. It's up to you to make the call on whether how important that is to you. But overall, mechanically, and except for that one building and the problems it causes, I really dig this expansion. Now, Builders and Blankenberg Fields and Flocks is live now on Kickstarter. Uh, if you search for Builders and Blankenberg kick, uh, on Kickstarter, you'll find it right away. Uh, the project has not funded yet. But they are on target. They were about halfway there last time I checked. So it worth checking out, I think, especially if you like the original game. If you haven't tried the original game, I do recommend it. And uh, as an added bonus, the expansion comes with a full reprint of all cards from the base game with higher card stock and uh, just, uh, 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 adjustment of some of the graphics to uh, help colorblind players. Yes. And uh, they've rebalanced that. Yeah, and the other thing they did do is they are adding, so they will tell you if the cards are male or female, so at least you don't have to make that call based on art. That is one improvement they did make. I Which don't know was a real problem during uh, during yes. some gameplay. Yeah, it was a problem. We, we couldn't tell if the blacksmith was a male or a female. I'll admit, my head says, oh, a blacksmith's got to be a male, but why not? Yeah. All right. Now, a quick shout out and a thank you to our Patreon backers. Their support helps make this show possible. 
Misdirected Mark, join Phil, Chris, Bob, and Camden every Tuesday night at 8 p.m. Eastern as they talk games and games mastering. Brian Kurtz, thank you. Duran Barnett, thanks. Joe Swick, thanks a lot. Jeff Seuss, thanks, Jeff. William Fisher, thank you. Diane Tuzano, thanks, Ma. Danielle Thomas, thanks a lot. P.S. Goujon, thanks. Andrew Dacey, thank you. Well, that was the double bell. That means my shift is coming to an end and we're going to have to lock the front doors. Though the doors to the lobby are closed, you can find us across the web and social media as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. You can also find us on Board Game Geek as guild number 3347. Drop by our website at tabletopbellhop.com for more gaming content. If you like the content we're providing and would like to support our continued efforts, please consider tipping the bellhop at patreon.com forward slash tabletop bellhop. Remember to join us here on Twitch every Wednesday night at 9.30 p.m. Eastern and watch for the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast to hit your podcatchers and YouTube at 2 a.m. Eastern every Tuesday. Well, that about wraps up the time we have for the show tonight. For those of you here live, thank you for joining us. Hang around and join us in the penthouse suite for the Off the Books After Show. For Tabletop Bellhop Live, I'm Sean. And I'm Mo. Thank you, and game on. <laughs>